Praise God. And welcome to our Bible study tonight at Christ Temple Apostolic Church. This year, our theme is on staying connected to Christ for life. And tonight, we are going to see how the matter of love or love matters impacts our connectedness to Christ. Let's go to God in prayer before we begin. God, I thank you for all who are joining us this evening. And God, I pray that you would let something be said that will bless, oh God, our hearts, our ears, our eyes. God, that you might be glorified and would be encouraged to walk in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, our theme for this year is on staying connected to Christ. And our overarching consideration is coming from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, that says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Now, tonight's Bible class does have a specific audience in mind. And it is all of us who have a desire to have the love of God working in our hearts and in what we do. This Bible class is designed for us who have a desire to have the love of God working in our hearts and in what we do. And tonight we're going to unpack that thought. Our launching text, and we'll be spending quite a bit of time in the book of 1 Corinthians, and specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, I'll encourage you to go ahead and pull that out, because even though we'll be spending some time uh, looking at some supporting text, for the most part, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So our launching text is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, I use the New King James Version of the Bible, unless I specifically say otherwise. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, I will tell you that this passage of scripture, I've heard many years, uh, since I've come to God about 28 years ago, 20, 20, 28, 29 years ago, um, I've heard these, the scripture, I've seen it read, I've seen it preached, and it's always amazed me how the Spirit of God takes what we typically consider as evidence of love and then shows that it is not what we think it is. And so he, I'm going to read it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. I'm going to go to verse 1 through 3 again because it's so profound what the Spirit of God is leading the Apostle Paul to write here to the Corinthian church. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And then he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And so tonight, we're going to talk about love matters. Love 
matters. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, when we saw the word love there, it is actually the lexical transliteration that, that's pronounced as agape. And it is it is a type of love that we're going to unpack here. And so again, that word love is based on agape, that lexical transliteration of the underlying Greek term. Question, what does agape love have to do with staying connected to Christ for life? What does agape love have to do with staying connected to Christ for life? The answer is that agape love is an essential aspect that exceeds everything else. No element of spirituality in our lives is good enough to have a successful relationship with Christ if we do not have agape love working inside of us. If we don't have the agape love that he requires us to have, no other spiritual aspect of our life is going to do our souls good. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about agape love here for a, a few minutes. The important matter of agape. I want to jump down to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And it's in this passage of text, the word says, and now abide faith, hope, love, talking about agape here, and now abide, now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So I thought about that, that the greatest of these is love. Now I'm going to bring in a couple more scriptures here, and then we're going to compare it to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Uh, one such scripture is John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, verse 23 to 24, this is Jesus talking to detractors, right? His detractors uh, doing his earthly ministry. And he says in John chapter 8, verse 23 and 24, and he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am, then you will die in your sins. And so we have Jesus here showing the importance of faith in him, right? Uh, in John chapter 8, verse 23, 24, think that we have to believe that he is, but that's an importance of faith. Let's look at one more scripture, another scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the word of God says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So we're talking, he's talking to those who are saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so we see the importance of faith both in John chapter 8, verse 23 and 24, and then we're also seeing the importance of faith in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And then in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so in John chapter 8, verse 23 and 24, in Ephesians chapter 8, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we see the importance of faith in the life of the believer. But notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, and now abide faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest is not faith. The greatest of these is love. So if we are to interpret that correctly, then that means we have to understand that if we do not have love, if love, if we do not have the agape that Christ says that we need to have, that's essential. 
if we do not have agape love working inside of us, and the Bible tells us that it is the greatest of between faith, hope, and love, that love is the greatest. If we don't have that, then that means that according to John 8, 23, 24, we will die in our sins because love is greater than the faith that's needed to believe that who he is. We can believe who Jesus is and then not have the love, the agape working in our heart, and we will still die in our sins not having that love, that agape working inside of us. If we don't have agape love working inside of us, then we will not continue to be saved right through faith because faith is, sub is subservient, is subjected to love. And so if there's no agape love, then there, there, no amount of faith does any good. We will still not be saved through faith. We must have the love working inside of us for Ephesians 2 and 8 even to be active. And then in Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. But if we don't have the agape love working inside of us, and agape love is preeminent uh, between faith, hope, and love, then that means it will be impossible for us to please him. So we, under, we have to understand that agape love is essential for staying connected to Christ for life. That having the love like God talks about is essential for staying connected to Christ for life. Now, how does agape love work? It's a good question. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, except now we're going to look in verse 4. So when I said we're going to spend some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tonight, uh, this is what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. It says, love, agape love, suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not par parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We have four power-packed verses here that's telling us how agape love works. It lets us know that agape love suffers long. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It meaning it's not prideful. It does not behave rudely. It is not concerned about its own. It's not provoked. It does not think evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things. And when it's talking about bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, it's actually talking about believing all things according to the word of God. It doesn't mean that Joe Blow on the street can come tell you something and you believe it. It doesn't mean that you see something on the internet or someone whisper something in the ear and you believe it. It's actually talking about bearing all things, believing all things, and hoping all things as committed in the apostolic doctrine, as committed in the doctrine as taught by the apostles of the Lamb. It is bearing, believing, and hoping all things and enduring all things. When I thought about this, imagine that we have a heart and we have a heart, right? And so typically when we look, think about the heart, we use a, like a valentine, right? A valentine, I guess. And so without agape love, 
working inside of us. Think of all the stuff that's going on inside of our heart. Without the agape love of God working inside of us, right? We can be impatient and rough acting. Uh, we have deep and envious desires. We we boast and, and, and parade ourselves. We get puffed up with pride. We were rude. You know, these are our heart. Not talking about outside that people see in our heart. We 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 are so seeking. Uh, we we were easily irritable. Uh, we track others wrong. We talk we talk about thinking on evil. We track others wrong. We keep track of them. And when others mess up, we take joy in their guiltiness. Um, we we are liable to in our mind to quit the uh, the apostolic teaching. We may not say it out loud, but in our heart, we've already decided to divorce the word of God, the apostles' doctrine. Well, and, and if we don't do it all together, then we add or take away. You know, we add or take away from the apostles' doctrine all in our heart. And we develop hope in something else other than the apostles' doctrine. That's scary. We develop hope in something else other than the apostles' doctrine. We can develop hope in 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 commentaries or books or bylaws or constitutions, we can develop hope in something else other than the word of God if we don't have agape love working inside of us. But when the love of God is working inside of us, it has a way of knocking these issues out of us. When we have the love of God that, and we're growing in grace and we are submitting ourselves to his word, and we're submitting our lives to him, and we're coming to him. God has a way, the more that we hold on to him, the more that we hold on to his word, the more that we allow the Holy Ghost to give us a mind to stay in his word. Agape love has a way of keeping our Valentine clean. It has a way of keeping our valentine clean. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, it says, for the love, the agape love, for the love of Christ compelled us. It compels us to keep our hearts, our valentine clean. It compels us to get rid of all the stuff all the negative thinking, all the negative emotions, all of the, the, the lust of the flesh that invades our hearts. And we have to remember that the Apostle Paul is being directed not to write to folks who don't know God, not to write to people who don't have a desire to love God. He's writing to people who have been saved. He's writing to people who have been baptized in Jesus' name. He's writing to people who have been filled with the Holy Ghost, and yet he's telling them that we have to let the love of God compel us. It compels us to keep our heart clean. Because if we don't let the love of God, if we don't let the love of God have its way, then other issues come in. Other issues come in, and it keeps those issues out. Agape compels us to resist the flesh. It compels us. It puts like a guard around our heart, right? We have the Holy Ghost working inside of us. We allow, and it's not just the Holy Ghost. We have to let the Holy Ghost have its way inside of us. And sometimes I, I, it's easier said than done. Because it's more than just words. It's more than just loving in word and deed. It's about letting the Holy Ghost have its way so that the agape love can compel, compel, constrain us, constrain us not to, to do what we would do, but to resist the lust of the flesh. Now, based on what we have discussed, it is evident that agape love is a compelling and constraining love of essential importance to those, to us, who are called to be saints. That agape love, it is evident that it compels us, it constrains us, it, 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 it's of essential importance 
to keep us who are called to be saints. But it's not the only essential love. Filial love is also extremely important to the spiritual well-being of the saints. Filial love is essential just like agape love. It's essential to the spiritual well-being of the saints. How important is the matter of filial love? Well, we are still in the book of 1 Corinthians, except now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. And if we want to know how important filial love is, let's see what the Spirit of God leaves the Apostle Paul to write near the end at the close of this first letter of this book, number one in our Bible, to the Corinthians. He says, if anyone does not love or filio the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. If anyone does not love or filio the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be be accursed. And so we see that filial love is not a lightweight love. Filial love is not something that we don't need to be concerned with because the Apostle Paul, under the leading of the Holy Ghost, is saying if anyone does not love filial, the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. In Revelation 3.19, when Jesus is the spirit of Christ is testifying about the issues within the seven churches. In one of the letters, he says, as many as I love filio, I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So filio is an outward display. It's an outward display. And isn't it interesting that Christ, when he talks about his outward displays of love, one of his outward displays of love is to rebuke and chasten. So it's fascinating to me that when we read the word of God, sometimes we can find ourselves looking at some of the harder points or the more they don't feel good, they're not comfortable. And the reason they don't feel comfortable is because they don't feel comfortable to the flesh. But Christ is letting us know that when we experience that, when we experience the rebuke of the word, when we experience the chastening of the word, Christ doesn't see that as an act of hate. Christ doesn't see that as an act of, of discouragement. Christ looks at it as an act of love. Christ looks at it as an act of caring, as an act of looking for our eternal well-being. And he says, as many as I love, and I filio, I rebuke and chasten. And so we see filial love is, is, is really important. And so what exactly is filial love? We kind of gave a little indication, but let's see it played out in scripture. How does the scripture talk about filial love, not just with Christ to us, but how about with us to Christ? How does filial love play out? Well, in Luke chapter 22, verse 47, it says, and while he was still speaking, talking about Christ, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to filial him. <clears throat> and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to filio him, to kiss him. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 14, verse 44. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I filio, I kiss, he is the one, sees him, and lead him away safely. 
Matthew chapter 26, verse 48. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I filio, he is the one, seize him. So this is kind of problematic because we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, that tells us whoever does not filio Christ, let him be accursed. Whoever does not filio Christ, whoever does not kiss Christ, whoever does not show affection to Christ, let him be accursed. Yet, we're seeing right here in Luke chapter 22, verse 47, Mark chapter 14, verse 44, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 48, that Judas is giving filio to Christ, and that creates a problem. Because now we have to talk about how that not all displays of affection are acts of love. Not all displays of affection are acts of love. Not all filio are indicative of agape. Not all filio means that there is agape. Real agape includes filio, but filio does not mean there is agape. We can have, if we have real love, real love for God, real agape, that real constraining, compelling love, it will include public displays of affection toward God. But public displays of affection does not mean that there is a real love for God. This is tough. This is, this is where the rubber hits the road because we see from the scripture regarding Judas, the betrayer of Christ, that one can have a public display of affection without an inward constraint to remain true to the truth. That one can have a public display doing all the right things that look Christian, that sound Christian, that, 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 they, I was baptized in Jesus' name just like you. I was filled with the Holy Ghost just like you and, and can look the part and give tithe and offering and can and can handshake and, and visit the sick. I mean, do all that and can have a public display of affection without an inward constraint to remain true to the truth. One can show affection for the body without being fully bought into the headship of Christ and the foundational authority of the apostles. This is, this is one of the things of scripture that is clear, but it's not something that we talk about a lot. Many don't talk about this, but we have a responsibility to use the word of God as it's given to us. And he's letting us know that there is, constraining love, the agape love on, on the inside of us that compels us to stay true to his doctrine. And then there's the public display, the filial love. But you can have a public display without having the internal. You can have a public display without being right on the inside. And we see that in Judas. We see that in Judas. Now, we might say, well, Judas betrayed Christ, of course. You know, he was, he was always phony. Well, he wasn't always phony, right? Because we know that it was not to the very end that he, that the enemy came into him. But the word of God is so com complete and so comprehensive. It actually gives us examples of men who were filled with the Holy Ghost and then they went astray. They started with agape. They started with filio, but then the agape went away somewhere. One such man was Nicholas. Nicholas was a leading man. He was one of the seven in the book of Acts chapter six. He was one of the seven. In fact, he was a proselyte. He was originally a, he was a Gentile who had converted to Ju Judaism before he got the Holy Ghost. And he's a faithful man. He's one of the seven and he goes astray. And we know he goes astray because in the book of Revelation, there is a sect called the Nicolaitans. 
And the Nicolaitans, when you look it up, it actually talks about the followers of Nicholas, that this man had went astray. He had went astray, even though he started right. He started with agape love. He started with filial love. But something happened. Something happened that by the time we're in the book of Revelation, we have Christ himself talking about that he cannot stand the way of the Nicolaitan in Revelation 2. He says he hates, he hates his ways. He hates the way he acts. Doesn't hate him, hates the way he acts. You also have preachers, teachers, who can start off the right way, start with the right message, be trusted teachers who began teaching non-apostolic messages. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, gives us the example of Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus and Philetus and their trusted teachers who began teaching a non-apostolic message. One thing I've noticed when I was going through and doing this study is that the worst, the worst type of backslider is not the one who leaves. The worst type of backslider is not the one who goes off of social media and starts talking and going heresy. The worst type of backslider is not the one who takes off and badmouths the people of God and God. That's not the worst type because their influence, their influence is already shot. The worst type of backslider is the one like Nicholas, who is a leading person, and they start to lead others astray. The worst type of backslider is the one like Hymenaeus and Philetus. They've already got a platform in their teaching, and they began to teach non-apostolic messages. They had folks that got saved under their ministry. They got folks who got delivered under their ministry. They got street cred, as we would say. They have, they have, they, they have so many works that they've done that people now give them the benefit of the doubt. And they begin to backslide and they don't leave, but they stay and they start to teach damnable doctrines. They start to teach messages that spread like cancer. They start to teach heresy because the agape love is not at work in their hearts even though the filial love is still being seen when we revisit first corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 to 3 it says though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love i have become sounding brass or a clanging symbol. I can go from saved to unsaved. I can go from speaking in tongues. I can go from speaking messages of deliverance. I can go from saved to unsaved and from wise to worldly wise. I can still have wisdom. Just like Solomon, God gave Solomon wisdom and then he went off, but he still had worldly wisdom. I can go from wise to un to I can go from wise to worldly wise if my agape for the apostolic doctrine goes cold. And then it says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Every spiritual gift that a person has God will still use, but it will not do the soul any good if the agape love is not at work in the heart. It doesn't matter what type of spiritual gift they have. It is a, it is a fallacy. It is false to think that because someone backslides, that now they're not effective. If that were true, we would not have to worry about Nicholas. We would not have had to worry about Hymenaeus. We would not have to worry about Philetus. They were still powerful and they were still effective because the gifts that God had given them were still working. But the problem is that the agape love had left their heart. The agape love for the apostolic doctrine, that agape love that kept them in line according to the word of God, the agape love that kept them from letting things in that shouldn't be in wasn't at work. And so they're gifted, they're anointed, but it's not doing their soul any good because 
the agape love for the apostolic doctrine was not at work. And he says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. This is probably the hardest thing to understand, to really get, because we know people, we say they're, they're such givers. They give, they give to everyone, they help everybody. And this is that person that we say, if anybody saved, they say, why do you know they're saved? Because they give to everybody. They help everybody. Anybody in need, they give. They're always opening up their homes. They're opening up their wallets. They're opening up their, for anybody who needs anything. And we just cannot imagine that this type of person can be lost. But here we see in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3, he says, though I bestow all my goods, I give away everything to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, I'm a martyr. I'm dying to help other people. And I have not love. He said, it profits me nothing. I can give everything I have, but it will be for nothing if I have not given my heart over to the agape love for the apostolic doctrine. This goes against secular Christianity. This goes against social Christianity. This goes against ecumenical Christianity. This goes against let's come along to get along Christianity. This goes against let's fellowship because we have something in common, even though it's not based on the apostolic doctrine. This goes against that. He says, I can give all that I have. I can be a martyr. But if I do not have love, if I do not have love, it promises me nothing. If I do not have agape, that compelling, that compelling, constraining, constraining, working on the inside, if I don't have that, it profits me nothing. As I close, as I close, if one is going to stay connected to Christ, if they're going to connect to Christ for life, they will have to attend to love matters. If a person is going to connect to Christ for life, they will have to attend to love matters. We have but one source available to assure hearts before God that we are in good standing and connected to him. We have but one source to ensure hearts are available that are in good standing and connected to him. And that is God's word. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, the apostle is led by the spirit of God to say, my little children, let us not agape love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let us love in deed and in truth. And he said, well, wait a minute, that seems like it's talking back just about, you know, giving all the stuff in 1 Corinthians. Indeed and in truth. Well, truth is not what we define it as. Truth is not saying, well, if you love, then you do this. If you love, you do that. No. Truth, according to God's word, is first, excuse me, is John 17, verse 17. That says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. If we want to make sure that the agape love is working in our hearts. We need to examine, we need to examine what it is that we are meditating on. What it is that guides what we do. Not, I feel okay in my heart. Not that it's going to be good for the body because filial love is important and filial love, that outward show for the body is important. But filial love is not decisive. It can get you street cred from people. It can have people pat us on the back. It can have people say, I know you love God. And we can get all that and, it can, and we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we have agape love working inside of us because of our filial love. But if we're going to be assure ourselves before God, that we're in good standing and connected to him in Christ, then we have got to make sure that we are being sanctified by the truth, that our actions are lining up with the truth, that our why, 
our why. Why do I do what I do? Can I can I justify what I do? Does God's word can I justify it in the word of God? Can, does the, did the apostles do what I do? Did the apostles can I find this model? Or do I find myself more in the vein of doing it, it looks good, but not having the apostolic doctrine love in my heart. It's a scary thing. It's a scary thing I can imagine to do the right thing and not be right in the heart because it can feel so good. But he lets us know if you want to make sure, if I want to make sure that I'm staying connected, if I want to assure my heart, if I want to assure my heart, which we all should want to have our hearts assured, then I need to make sure that I'm being sanctified by the truth, that the love for the apostolic teaching as taught by the apostles is working in my heart. Thank you for joining us tonight. I pray this was a blessing to you. I pray it's something that bless your soul. God bless you in Jesus' name.